Here's a data set we looked at back in section one of the course. It comes from an astronomy paper published in 1986 about large-scale structure in the universe. The data set consists of data about 120 galaxies and it has the radial speed at which those galaxies are moving away from us. We know the universe is expanding, so all galaxies are moving away from us, and the speed can be measured using redshift. Now, if the universe were uniform, with galaxies studied through it like cherries in a fruitcake, then we'd expect to see a smooth distribution of galaxy speeds, and this dashed black line shows that smooth distribution. But if the universe is made up of filaments of galaxies with great big voids in between, then when we plot a histogram of galaxy speeds, we'll see the speeds clustered. And that's what the histogram of this dataset suggests. So the theoretical distribution for a uniform universe doesn't match this histogram. But what would be a better fit for this dataset? Here's a fit we looked at in section 1.6, a Gaussian mixture model with three components. It looks like it fits much better. Perhaps there are three filaments of galaxies in our neighbourhood of the universe. Or maybe there are four. Maybe that third Gaussian component should actually be split into two. The question is, how far can we go at improving the fit? If we took a blank slate approach to this problem, if all we had was the data set and we didn't have any theory from astronomy to guide us, what is the best distribution that we can find? Do we trawl through every single random variable we can find on Wikipedia and fit them and all their possible variations? Or is there a better answer? There is a better answer and it's called the empirical distribution. And that's what the next videos will all be about. There aren't going to be any worked examples here and there'll hardly even be any maths or code. What it's really about is transforming our perspective to realise that the question, what's the best distribution, is a bad question to ask. In many academic fields, there comes a point where you step up the level of abstraction. In computer science, for example, one of the big steps is going from thinking about algorithms to thinking about types. In data science and machine learning, the big conceptual step is rethinking the relationship between data sets and random variables. We've been working with the two all along, where given a data set, we choose a random variable model, we fit it using maximum likelihood and so on. But what I want to persuade you of over the next couple of videos is that there's a more abstract way to see them, a more powerful way. And in this more abstract view, data sets and probability distributions are the same thing. There won't be much payoff for a while, I'm afraid. All this stuff about data sets and random variables, we're going to spend two videos on it, then put it to one side and go back to inference. Only then will we be able to join the two strands of our thinking together. We'll see how data sets as distributions can be used in inference, and we'll be able to link this to the cornerstone idea of machine learning, the idea of validation on a holdout set. Okay, enough of the waffle. Here is a definition. Pause the video and have a read. This function we've defined, f hat of x, it's a function that accepts any floating point number x and returns a value in the range 0 to 1. Let's think through how we'd plot it. Here are axes, x on the horizontal axis, and I want to plot f hat of x on the vertical axis. Here's a point to start with. At x equal to the minimum value in the data set, what is f hat of x? Well, the data set only has one item less than or equal to the smallest, namely the smallest item itself. Let's assume for the time being that there are no duplicates. Once we've gone through all this, it'll be easy to see what to do with duplicates. OK, so f hat of x must be 1 on n for this x value because there's only one relevant data point. How about when x equals the second smallest value in the data set? Same as before, now there are two points that are less than or equal to x, and so on for the third smallest. Now, let's think about the value of f hat of x in between these points. For any x smaller than the minimum value, f hat of x equals zero because there are no points. For any x in between the smallest and the second smallest, 
the number of data points that this definition scoops up doesn't change, it's still just one data point, so f hat of x is flat between those two values. And we can fill in the rest of the f hat function like this. It's a step function. It's almost embarrassingly simple to plot it. Just sort the x values, pick evenly spaced values on the y-axis going from 1 on n up, and plot it. Matplotlib has an option saying plot it as steps. Now, let's go back to the problem of duplicates. Let's look at an example. Here's a data set with duplicates. And let's go through the same process and plot f hat at interesting points. The nifty thing here, though, is I get the same answer whether I think carefully about the value of f hat at every point, or whether I just blindly follow the code recipe here, which just plots an extra point at point 0.8 comma one third. When I draw the step function, it all comes out the same. So this code snippet is all we ever need for plotting an ECDF, whether or not our data set has duplicates. Here is the ECDF for the Galaxies data set we saw at the beginning of this video. It's an increasing function, of course, going from 0 to 1. It has steep bits where there are many data points and flat bits where there are few data points. Incidentally, one neat thing about the empirical CDF is that you don't need to bin data to plot it. This bottom plot shows every single data point, whereas the top plot only shows an aggregate, and you always have to worry about whether you're distorting your plot by the way you've chosen your bin sizes. Anyway, here is the PDF of the theoretical distribution for a uniform universe in the top plot, and here is its CDF in the bottom plot. Both of them show us it's a bad fit. And here's our other distribution, modelling it as a Gaussian mixture random variable. The random variable's PDF looks like it fits much better, and its CDF tracks the empirical CDF of the test set very closely. This is what a good fit looks like. But could we do better? If we wanted a perfect fit, we could just try drawing a very detailed custom PDF to try and match all the ins and outs of the histogram as closely as possible, and then we could, in principle, try to figure out how to sample values from the random variable with this PDF. But this is very tricky to get right. What if we've drawn something that isn't even a PDF? A PDF has to integrate to one, and this is hard to enforce when we're just sketching a curve by hand. If I try to make my PDF a bit taller in one place to fit the histogram better, I have to make it smaller everywhere else, and this is very fiddly to do. A much simpler idea is to draw a custom CDF. Any custom CDF we draw is legitimate, as long as it's an increasing function, or to be technical about it, a non-decreasing function, between 0 and 1. So the only question left is, once we've got our custom CDF that's a very tight fit for the data set, how do we go about generating a random variable from it? Let's work through some examples to build up intuition for the link between custom CDFs and code. Let's start with the simplest possible CDF. When you see this CDF, you should immediately recognize it as a uniform distribution, uniform in the range u to v. This CDF has a constant slope, which means that when you differentiate it with respect to x, you get a constant which means that the PDF is constant, which means that all values in the range u to v are equally likely. In other words, it's a uniform random variable. Okay, this one you should learn by heart and be ready to use it at a moment's notice. Next, how would you generate a random variable that has this CDF? This one takes a bit more creative thinking. This is a good time to stop and think. Pause the video, see if you can think up code to generate a random variable with this CDF, and then when you're ready, press play. The way I'd reason about it is this. Let's first look at the inflection point in the graph, the point at v, p. When we translate this point into 
what a CDF is, it's telling us we want the probability that our random variable is less than or equal to v. We want that probability to be equal to p. So the first thing I'm going to do is make a choice. Either generate something to the left of v with probability p, or generate something to the right of v with probability 1 minus p. If I've decided to generate something on the left, then all values between u and v are equally likely because the CDF has constant slope. So I'll simply generate a uniform random variable. Likewise, if I've decided to generate something on the right, I'll generate a different uniform. It's worth staring at this for a while. I've talked about why the CDF on the left translates to the code on the right, but you should also spend some time thinking about it the other way. If someone gave you the code on the right, could you derive its CDF? Look back at section 4.3 for a reminder of how to solve this sort of problem. And once you're happy, let's go on to the next example. Here is another CDF. Let's break it down in just the same way. First, decide if we want to be on the left part or the right part. The CDF tells me the probability of each is a half, so it's just a simple call to np.random.choice. I don't even need to specify the probabilities. Then, just as before, I'll choose a uniform random variable to generate with parameters based on which side I'm on. The flat bit between u2 and v1 doesn't matter. If the CDF is flat, then the PDF, i.e. the derivative of the CDF, is equal to zero. So we don't want to generate any values in that range. OK, here's another one. This one's exactly the same as the last one, just with different variable names. Here, the two uniforms are very narrow. There's a uniform of x1 minus delta to x1 plus delta, and another for a small bound around x2, but exactly the same code as before. Now, let's take it to the extreme. Let's let delta go to zero, giving us a step function. If we take just the same code as before, and ask what happens when delta is set to zero, it's easy. Either return x1 or return x2. Well, actually, this is a daft way to write this code. All this code does is return x1 with probability a half, return x2 with probability a half, and we can write it much more simply, np.random.choice of x1, x2. This just returns one of them chosen at random, each equally likely. Clearly, this generalizes very easily to arbitrary length lists. Here, if x with an arrow on top is a list of data points, and we pick an item at random from the list, the CDF is just this step function. Let's write that out formally. Let x star be the random variable obtained by choosing a value at random from the list. The CDF of this random variable is given by this formula here. Now, where have we seen this before? It's nothing other than the empirical cumulative distribution function for a data set. In other words, we've got a random variable which is a perfect match for the data set's empirical cumulative distribution function. So this answers the question we asked at the beginning of the video. How good a fit can we find for the data set? The answer is that we can find an absolutely perfect 100% spot on fit, and we don't need to know any standard random variables or any probability modeling at all. We don't even need to know maximum likelihood estimation to find this fit. This should make you stop and think, what on earth were we doing for the first half of this course, fitting probability models left, right, and center, when the perfect fit is staring us in the face and doesn't need any maths at all? Sometimes, PhD supervisors used to send their students to me to help them out with modeling work. I often heard the question, Dr. Wishick, here's my data set. What distribution should I use to model it? And I told the students, use the distribution of the data set. Sometimes they went away enlightened. Sometimes they went away and asked a friend who told them, hey, here's a clever Gumbel distribution or a logistic distribution or exponential or whatever, and here's some code to fit it. And that answer made them happy. But what that means is that they haven't thought hard enough about the question they actually wanted answered. 
we're halfway to enlightenment here. In the next video, I'll wrap up this discussion of empirical distributions and show you how it links to several other ideas that we've seen in the course.